The title of my lecture today is Excellence and Equity, and I'm talking to a group of young people who are about to become teachers, and I'm challenging them to think about what is their role in terms of developing an education system that can really reach every child and every young person. Okay, well, good afternoon. It's very nice to be here to address you this afternoon. I belong to a group in the university under the heading Centre for Equity in Education, and you'll see, if you can read it from the distance, that the strap line of our centre is making sure every child matters. Now, you'll know that the phrase every child matters is a big policy uh, headline in the English education system, and it has been for the last few years, um, and it's an attempt to signal the fact that we really have to make efforts to ensure that every young person gets a, a, a fair deal in that respect, really. So our headline is around the concept of equity, and I take equ equity to mean including everybody, first of all, but then also making sure everybody is treated fairly. But of course, inevitably, our education system reflects our society, and you'll have your own views, but my opinion would be that we live in a relatively unfair society, and to some extent, therefore, our schools and our school system reflects that unfairness in that respect. So my, my argument is that the big challenge that we face in our education system is how do we continue on the journey of making sure that our education system is excellent, by world standards, so that we're preparing young people who can contribute to the development of our society, both socially and economically, whilst at the same time ensuring that that ensures that every child really matters in that respect. So in this lecture, what I'm wanting to do really is to challenge you to think about your own thinking and what do you believe is possible? I mean, is there more we could do to move our system forward? In the first section of the lecture, I want to challenge the students to think about the state of development of the English education system. And I'm going to do that by drawing comparisons with developments in other countries. Internationally, since 1990, the big push uh, across the whole world has been driven by the phrase, education for all. There was a major conference in 1990 organized by the United Nations. And what they were trying to do was to get all countries to commit themselves to the idea that we should ensure that every child gets a basic education. And of course the priority inevitably in the United Nations organizations is with those countries that uh, at the moment don't provide education for all their children simply because they haven't enough schools and they haven't enough teachers really. And this photograph taken in the city of Mumbai in India is, you may be surprised to hear, a, a photograph of a school. It's a school that serves a very poor neighborhood where people live in the most appalling poor conditions. And Prior to the taking of this photograph, these children did not receive education. Now, the current estimate is that across the world, approximately, and it is an estimate, 70 million children never step inside a classroom because there aren't any classrooms where they live. Now, in a sense, these, these, these children who you're looking at here, these very young children, were part of this 70 million. And apparently what happened was a group of local parents, mothers, got together and formed a committee, and they decided they were going to do something about it. So they collected some money, and they literally built a school. Now, I show you that photograph for two reasons, really. One, to remind us, in case we forget, that we live in one of the wealthiest countries of the world, and we have resources available to us, physical resources and human resources, beyond the imagination of the vast majority of countries of the world. So when we moan about lack of resources in our education system, at the same time, we should remind ourselves that we are very privileged. And that means, therefore, that we have an enormous duty to make sure that we are using those resources as effectively as possible. So part of my argument and part of the discussion I want to have with you is to think about, are we at the moment using the resources as effectively we, as we could do to reach all the young people, and especially those we're not reaching at the moment. So that's the first part of, of why I show you that photograph. But the second part really is my central message. And my central message is this, that the, the major thing we need to improve and develop our education system is in fact the will to make it happen. And what you take from a story like this, which is rather humbling, that when a group of people, in this case a group of mothers, get together and they have the commitment and the drive and they work together, then it's possible to make quite dramatic improvements in any education system. So that's the message I take from that. And the challenge I, it, it, it therefore uh, puts to all of us, and I include myself, is are we doing enough and are we, do we have that collective will, which is my uh, central message. So with that in mind, what do we know about the English education system? 
Well, you may have been told, if you haven't, I'll tell you, that about two years ago, UNICEF did a study of 22 of the wealthiest countries of the world. And in that study, what they tried to determine was, how do children and young people feel about themselves and their places in their societies? Well, frankly, it, the news is rather bad because if we were a football team, we would be relegated. We were number 22 in the 22 countries. Interestingly, if you're interested, the country that came top was the Netherlands. So I'm, I'm not starting initially with focus on, on the usual thing that we bang on about in education, examination results and test results. I'm talking about well-being. How, uh, how do we help our young people to feel confident and assured and happy about their, their position in society? We have, by the comparison of most other wealthy countries, a very interesting taken-for-granted strategy, which says, or policy in fact, which says that if we have some young people who we don't like the sound of or the look of and misbehave, then we can actually exclude them from the school. England is one of the few countries that actually has legal provision to exclude children. And that's not to say that other countries don't have other systems, informal systems, for clearing a few children out. But it's interesting that we have that uh, legal provision. Now, this is a complex issue, and it creates many dilemmas, particularly for senior people in school, because, of course, if you have a number of youngsters who are difficult and awkward and possibly violent, then you have to think about your responsibility to the majority. But nevertheless, what we know is those young people who are thrown out of school, sometimes temporarily and sometimes permanently, the prognosis for them is extremely bad. Whilst we may think we are throwing them away, we don't throw them away. Many of them drift into lifestyles which mean that they do actually become part of our lives in a way which we would prefer didn't happen. Associated with that and all these factors interconnect, there is the issue about school attendance. In this city of Manchester, for example, on any day of the week, something like 10% of our boys and girls in primary schools and in secondary schools are not in school. And it's not the same 10% every day. And we've come to take that for granted. And I'm not picking just on Manchester, because we, we could say it about many, particularly of our urban local authorities, that the levels of attendance in our schools are frankly, by international standards, appalling. For quite a lot of years, I've been associated with Hong Kong, and I've worked with the schools in Hong Kong. And uh, a few years ago, I was having lunch with the head teacher and deputy head of a very large secondary school in the New Territories. And in the middle of the lunch, for, for no apparent reason, I suddenly thought about attendance. And I said to the two colleagues, do you have much of a problem with attendance in your school? And they thought for a moment, and then one of them started to talk about an 11-year-old girl who was ill. And the question, do you have a problem with attendance, led them to think about one student. Because the idea in their society that the young people would not attend school is beyond their imagination. Because in that society, going to school is seen as the key to success in your life. You want to be at school. You're rushing to school. Your, pa your parents and your family are desperately keen you're in school because they know how important it is within their lives. Now, in our society, we don't have that. It's not just about schools, it's a cultural thing within our communities in that respect. Now clearly, the young people who don't attend school regularly, the chances that school could provide for them are likely to be blocked. And of course the question of attendance must be linked also to the nature of what we offer and whether it's attractive enough to make some of our young people, particularly in the teenage years, get up in the morning, get dressed and uh, uh, go to school. Another feature of our system which is rather striking in terms of international comparison is that of the way in which young people at 16 leave education. I've used the phrase here, drop out. And in some cases, they may go off and, and have a very successful life and, and, and gain employment and so on. But for the vast majority of them who don't go into further education or into training, then that is that other pathway to lifestyles which mean your health, your employment possibilities, your housing conditions are likely to be less attractive than the vast majority of the population. And there's an interesting dimension to this in terms of the pressures I'm sure you're being put on in your schools to improve the attainment of your young people. We did a, a project for some years with one local authority which was so successful in proving examination results that the government designated it as a beacon authority for school improvement. We looked at the impact of all that on these young people in an area which is relatively disadvantaged. 
And what we found was, over those years, even though examination results had improved, in terms of young people going on to further education, on to employment, certainly on to enrollment in universities, and particularly very attractive universities like this one, very little had changed. And what a cynic might argue is, in that community, what we now have is a much higher, better qualified cohort of young unemployed people. So what it suggests to us in terms of improving what we provide for young people, of course improving attainment, test and examination results is important and necessary, but of itself it is insufficient. There's something else about the nature of education and the nature of our society which creates a kind of block in the pathways to opportunities that the majority of people are available to. And so that brings you to what for me is the most significant point that we have to think about, and that is the link between home background, educational performance, and life chances. The photograph is one that you may have seen. It's often in the newspapers. It was taken in the 1930s. Here are these young toffs who are going to one of our great public schools. Don't know which one it is. And here are the local lads in the fashion of the time in the 1930s, looking at them as if they'd come from Mars, you know. Frankly, we could take that photograph in 2010. You know, the, the, the fashions of the, the, the local lads would have changed. Probably the dress of the public school boys wouldn't have changed. But this sense in which the hierarchy of our society, which is reflected in all sorts of things to do with our lifestyles, is also reproduced in, and some would argue, through our school system. Such that for some young people, their home circumstances, their background, is the best predictor of what is likely to happen to them. And when we look at international comparisons, and we look at my dual concepts of excellence and equity, even though things have improved in the English education system, in comparison with other countries, in areas like maths and science, we still have this enormous tale of young people who are left behind. And the key correlate, the thing that is most associated with that, is the background and home circumstances of the young people. I think we have to do something more to break that gap. So I want you to, first of all, then, before we think about the practicalities of that as educators, to think about it as a citizen. Uh, think about it as well, I suspect, in terms of your own life chances, really. How many of you in this room are the first members of your family who went to university? How many of you? Mm, I'm thinking it's almost half the people in the room, including me, I should explain. You know? So what do you feel about that? Just take two minutes, talk to the person next to you. What do you feel about our situation in the, in the English school system? No, I wasn't. A bit. There was sort of a, an expectation, as it were, uh, because I was sort of following on from my uh, sisters and so on. So I think there was an expectation of going on to further education. I'd just like to get a flavour of that. I mean, obviously, you've talked in detail, and we can't get the deal, but just a flavour. If a few people just give me two or three words or a sentence, what do you talk about? We talked about um, whether a system incorporating grammar and comprehensive schools um, and independent schools was the best system, or whether, yeah. and whether it encouraged um, parental involvement in education. Yeah, yeah the sort of structure of the system. And, of yeah. course, there, there is a political consensus now that choice in all the public services, including education, is it taken for granted. It's non-negotiable now that people should have a choice, and, and, and why not in that respect? Can I ask the young ladies there, what did you talk about? Um, we actually found it interesting that um, we were both encouraged to go to university by our parents rather than school. And I went to a sixth form, which perhaps was maybe 100 people in the year group. And out of, that, out of those 100, 20 people went on to go to university. And I'm 27. That's not that long ago. No. Um, and that seems to me like quite a low number. And it was maybe my parents that encouraged me more than the school to go to uni. Yes. And in the schools you're visiting now, do you get the impression the schools are more proactive perhaps in than where you were? I th no, I do. I think so. Yeah, I think, I think it's changed dramatically um, within that small amount of time. But, you know, I guess yes. it changes from school to school. Yes. So Many of our young people are not getting the push from parents because the parents don't know about that or don't understand what it's about in that respect. Uh, and I mean, I think it's an interesting question about, and those of you who are or will work in some of our inner city schools, for example, uh, almost to the point where you are acting as a replacement for the parents in that sense, obviously you can't replace the parents, but actually m making sure that young people know what's possible when they haven't got that advice from their families. 
In the next section of the lecture, I want to draw on the research that we've been doing here at the University of Manchester over many years to provide a commentary on where the English education system is and to indicate the kind of young people who are vulnerable and the sorts of strategies I think we now need to develop to reach these students. Our centre, as I said, is, is concerned with carrying out research within the English education system as well as being commentators on the development of the system, we're actually trying to intervene, we're trying to make a contribution. And so we carry out a whole series of different kinds of research studies, and as we collect information together, we're trying to in use that information to stimulate further thinking in the field, to think about it, uh, to, to stimulate thinking amongst policy makers, and of course amongst practitioners. But we're interested in getting close to understand not only what's happening in terms of these issues that we're uh, debating of equity, but why is it like that? Because our argument is, if we don't know why some people don't understand what's possible for their children and young people, if we don't know why, we won't know what to do about it in that respect. So a lot of our research is done close through observation, through interviewing, through engagement over time in schools, in classrooms, in systems. We also get involved in what we call development and research projects. These are where we establish partnerships, sometimes with local authorities, but in, more and more in, now, because the role of local authorities has, has, has changed and is changing, with groups of schools, with networks of schools. And what we try to do is we work with them to address the challenge of equity, not to tell them what to do because that not our skill, the skill that we need is there in schools, the skill of teachers and, and, and teaching assistants and learning mentors, and indeed children in the community. But we work with them to bring a kind of an inquiry-based approach so that they can actually investigate their own efforts to improve the situation. Now reflecting on the evidence that we've collected, one can build up an argument of what it suggests might need to be done to take our system forward. Remember my analysis, a system that does very well for the majority of children, but leaves very significant numbers of young people behind, many of whom come from relatively disadvantaged backgrounds of one kind or another. So my question is, what else can we do? And remembering in a system that's pretty well resourced by international standards. Our analysis suggests that the system, as it stands at the moment, still has more capacity to move forward. And when I'm talking to people from schools, and especially head teachers, as I do quite frequently, I say to them, look, my experience tells me that on any one day in your school, there is more expertise, more knowledge, more skill, more creativity than is being used. Schools know more than they use. So the logic, if you believe that, is that the starting point for development has surely got to be better use of that expertise that's there in any school on any day. And I mean literally any school, whether it's a very successful school or indeed as a school that's considered to be a so-called failing school. Much of what we have to do to move forward then is to be better at analysing the context of the school to find that expertise and mobilise it. So we've had endless endless, goodness knows how many, different kinds of national strategies which have tried to intervene into the system that has taken an approach which is intended to improve the system with notions of equity in mind. So it's very well intended. And I, I don't want to completely rubbish all of that because there is no doubt that it has had a positive impact. I'm talking, for example, in terms of, of the incredible hard work that our teachers do, who have very high standards in terms of preparation and the way they do their work. And I hope that's what you're seeing in the schools you go into, by and large. I also think our school system is better managed and better led, and therefore resources are used effectively. So we've seen significant changes, and I'd want to celebrate that, and I wouldn't want to deny it. But my feeling and our research would suggest the downside of that is that it has tended to dull creativity. It has become formulaic. And clearly, if it was going to work in terms of the young people we were, we're still struggling with, it would have already worked. So I'm saying, let's build on the best of that, but we now have to do something else if we're to reach out to the young people we're not reaching at the moment. So I'm suggesting we need a new era, really, a new phase in the development of our education system. And I think there is evidence that this is being increasingly recognised even at the very top of the system in terms of policy makers, politicians, civil servants. A recognition that the system has plateaued 
And if we continue doing the same, we'll get more of the same. So we have to have a change. It's already been signalled recently through the white paper. The white paper that was published last June on the idea of the 21st century school system is very much signalling a move towards much more decentralised approaches where through a local analysis of systems we try to develop strategies that fit the circumstances in a particular area. Now, what the research would say to us is if this therefore is about mobilising resources and encouraging more creativity in order that we can explore new ways of reaching the young people we're not reaching, then an essential element must be an emphasis on collaboration. If we look at the most successful schools, particularly the most successful schools in our tough urban context, a common feature of all those very successful schools is an emphasis on collaboration, working together, teamwork. Teachers working with teachers, teachers working with support staff, teachers working with students, students working with students, collaboration between students, and of course schools working with families, communities, and other kind of stakeholders. What we know about collaboration is that it can stimulate people to work together and invent things. Now, the other thing that we have been learning over recent years, and we're still at the foothills of understanding the potential of this, is not just collaboration within schools, but collaboration between schools. And collaboration can sometimes mean just a lot of meetings and a lot of talking, and it doesn't go anywhere. But when it works, it is very, very powerful. So I'm arguing that really in this next phase, if we're to bring more creativity in the system, we have to strengthen collaboration within schools and between schools. But we mustn't get carried away, and I have a, a danger of doing that in terms of becoming rather romantic about it. You can collaborate with people to do nothing. You can collaborate with people and collude with them to say there's nothing more we can do. Given the background of these children, given their circumstances, given the attitudes of their parents, there's nothing more we can do. You can, you can use collaboration as a form of resistance to change. So when we're talking about collaboration as a, a very important foundation for developing more, education, more effective and equitable forms of education, we have to learn how to collaborate in an effective way. Now our monitoring suggests that there is an element that you have to build into it that really does stimulate the potential for creativity on all of this, and it's to do with engaging with evidence. And what we've observed is that under the right conditions, a collaboration within a school, and then again between schools, and it may be more than two schools, that engages with evidence brings to the discussion a challenge that stops people in their steps. I've characterised it previously as creating interruptions deliberately interrupting the lives of busy people who are working very hard and say, let's stop and think for a moment. Is there something we're missing here? Now, evidence can take many forms. And the obvious form that the school system is very kind of excited about and preoccupied with is statistical evidence. So we can now make comparisons. We can make comparisons between girls and boys between youngsters from different kind of neighbourhoods or from different ethnic backgrounds. We can monitor the development of young people in public care, those with special needs. We can also now compare very similar schools who serve similar populations and ask questions about why is it the history department in that school is doing so much better with similar youngsters than the history part, uh, uh, department in another school and is there some practice there that we can move around? But of course, what research methodologists would always tell you is that every method has its strengths and every method has its limitations. And what statistics is very good at is telling you what it looks like. It gives you a pattern. So you know who's attending, who's not attending, who's doing well, who's not doing well. But it, what it doesn't tell you, or very little about, is why it's like that. And when you know why, then you can be start to think creatively about, well, what are we going to do about it? It moves you to the how question. What, what is it that we will do here to improve the situation? Now, through the work we do with schools, and this is, our, in a sense, our big agenda in, in, in many of the projects we do, what we've tried to do is work alongside teachers and other people in schools, and increasingly students themselves, in helping them to think about how they can collect evidence and engage with evidence in such a way that it stimulates their creativity. Now, there are many possibilities, but the two that are, I think are most important are these. First of all, the evidence collected through mutual observation. 
schools that are very powerful and effective in developing a capacity to cater for learner diversity recognize that professional people have to learn from one another. And in order to learn from one another, you have to see one another working. Because when you see one another working, that stimulates you to talk and to develop a language of practice so that you can share ideas with one another and at the same time talk to yourself about your practice so you can engage and reflect on what you do. And teachers have to see one another working and they have to have quality time to talk about their practice. Now in very successful schools, in my experience, senior management recognise that and they build it into the timetable. The other kind of evidence which I also believe is essential is evidence from the young people themselves, the voice of the learner. If we're to understand our teaching, what's working, what's not working, what's helping, which is or what is creating a barrier, then we have to understand what it's like from the point of view of the learners themselves, from the students. Now, I'm suggesting to you that it's through an engagement with that kind of evidence that deliberately sets out to make us stop and think that you then create a kind of uh, 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 an atmosphere of debate within a collaboration which leads to the uh, experimentation with new ways of working. Everything I've talked about is about what goes on within schools, but a lot of the research now is pointing to the limitations of that. What we need to do really is to link what we're doing in schools to community development. We have to link it obviously to improvements in housing, in transport, in terms of career opportunities in that sense. And that's what you, why you'll be seeing, I hope, and hearing a lot of talk about in your school, uh, the efforts to extend the role of the school into the community. It's quite problematic because it's quite demanding of time, but it seems to me that if we don't have that link, improving the schools, but also linking that to developments in communities, then we will, as I say, run out of steam. The final point in my kind of list of ideas is how the heck do we make this happen? And it does seem to me this takes us to the issue of how the system is managed and the forms of leadership that are provided at every level. Of course, there are big roles for government in providing a clear idea of where we're heading, in monitoring the system, in providing the resources. But we need freedom at the local level to enable this collaboration to go on. But then the crucial leadership is what goes on in the school itself. The leadership provided by heads of departments, Head teachers, deputy head teachers, but ultimately the leadership that the teacher provides in the classroom. When you go in your classroom and close the door, for the next hour you are the policy for those children. You may or may not have read the national policy, you may or may not have heard what the head teacher said in the briefing in the morning, you may or may not agree with it or understand it, but ultimately what the kids get is what you provide for them in that respect. So we need leadership at every level of the system which is committed to the idea that every child matters, to committed to the idea that collaboration is necessary and that we need to engage with all the various stakeholders. So everybody has a role to play in all of that. That, in essence, is the argument that comes from our observations of working with the system over quite a lot of years now. I'm interested to think about, does that connect to what you're seeing in the schools? Are you seeing examples of the kind of thing I'm talking about? In the best schools that you've worked in, are you seeing an emphasis on collaboration, an emphasis on um, uh, engaging with evidence? Are you seeing that the schools are engaging with the family, with the communities, with local businesses, with the mosques, the, the churches and so on? The possibilities are endless when you start to extend the role of education to be the responsibility of the wider community. The third part of the lecture is, is a short session uh, where I want to just put in a, a word of caution because I want to explain to the students that what I'm talking about is possible but it's quite challenging. I want to give you an example of the kind of thing I meant earlier when I said about engaging with evidence. One of the things we've been working on a lot in recent years is the idea of using research in the school to inform development and I don't mean research done by people like me on the school, I mean research done by people within the school through mutual observation, through listening to the voice of children, through all, all sorts of other procedures, so that actually research or inquiry or evidence is used as a stimulus for creativity in that respect. And as we've got into that, we've become increasingly preoccupied with the importance, as I said earlier, of the voice of the learner themselves. So much so now that we have been working in quite a lot of schools on young people themselves doing research into their own experience with the school. 
The story I tell you is a school that we've had a relationship for quite a long time. Uh, it's a school in a quite uh, disadvantaged community, a multicultural community, a school that has made enormous progress in terms of overall results, excellence, but also has really worked on notions of inclusion and social justice, making sure that every child matters. And a few years ago, as part of our engagement with that school, we talked about to the senior staff about the idea of student voice, and we talked about the idea of students being researchers, and they said they wanted to have a go at it. And they invited this group of young students, well, I say young students, they were in year 11, uh, 15 and 16 year olds, to carry out a project with us to look at aspects of inclusion in their school. And we introduced to them a technique that we've been developing of using photographs to get young people to talk about their school. The young people who were chosen were chosen to reflect different perspectives in their school. So there's girls and boys, there's young people from different ethnic backgrounds, there's very successful learners, there's some very unsuccessful learners. And on a particular day that was negotiated with the staff of the school, these young people were put in pairs and they were given a camera and they were told to go around their school and take photographs. Places where you feel valued and welcomed and places where you don't feel valued and welcomed. And then afterwards, uh, my colleague Ian worked with the pairs to get them to talk about the photographs and to develop posters which illustrated their views of their schools. Some of the young people, but not all, took photographs of sports areas because they saw that in a positive way. Some of them took po uh, photographs of the library resource area. They thought this was a very pleasant place to be, particularly in the winter when it was cold and wet outside. Quite a few of them took pictures of the art room. When they talked about their photographs, they said, what we like about the art room is the atmosphere. The teachers there usually play music. It's very relaxed, it's very informal. We like the feel about it. Some people took photographs of particular teachers. The photographs that they took of teachers were generally the teachers that they liked the best. And typically, what they like, young people, is they like teachers who are well organized, who get things done, who use time effectively, but importantly, who treat them as human beings who would take an interest in them. So these young people took the photographs of the teachers they really liked, but then emerged from the discussion a slightly darker side to the school. And in any school, however good it is, there will be a darker side. Because some of the students talked about other teachers whose photographs they didn't take, and about their attitudes. Some of these attitudes were about race, some of them were about gender. All the pairs of students took photographs of the staff room. And of course, normally they're not allowed to go in the staff room. They thought, it was, they thought it was great fun that they could go in there. And this is a great place. They said, look at it. Easy chairs. You can make your tea in the corner. There's a photocopy. They thought it was a fantastic thing that the teachers had this space that they could go in. And then they compared that with the spaces that were available to them in their spare time. And again, in every case, every pair of students took pictures of the toilets. Now this is a rather interesting phenomenon. We're part of a network internationally who are trialling these kind of methods in schools. And wherever we've done that and said to kids, take photographs, they always take pictures of the toilets. And you think, what the hell is this about? Now often when they do take pictures of the photographs, they talk about how disgusting they are and smelly. And then sometimes they admit that partly that's their own fault. But more importantly, they talk about how the toilets are places where you can go and have a bit of privacy and talk to your friends and make arrangements or have a cigarette. And it reminds us, you know, in case we forget, that for young people, I'm sorry to tell you, probably in most cases, the lessons are not the most important part of the school day. The lessons are the things you have to put up with so you can go to school and make arrangements and develop your social life. That's why being excluded from the school, the local school, is such a, a, such a bad thing because you're not l having these learning opportunities, not the academic learning, but the social learning. So this thing about the spaces seems to be something that, you know, we've forgotten about or perhaps we just ignore, or perhaps we're just too busy to think about. In this particular school, there was another space where people took photographs. It was called the tunnel. And the young people talked about the tunnel, and some said, it's a great place. I go there to meet my friends, and we chat, and we have a cigarette. The teachers never go there. But then other the young people said, golly, I would never go there. It's a dangerous place. We get bullied if we go there. Anyway, these young people, they produced their posters, and uh, we collected their stories with their permission, and we uh, developed a report on what they talked about in the school. 
they were incredibly positive about the school. They thought their school was a fantastic place. They thought it was a wonderful place and they would recommend it to anybody. But as I said, there were these darker stories, things that concerned the young people about their school. And there always is in our experience. One particular story stays with me. There was a boy, Sean, a very small boy. And as he was making his poster with his friend and talking to my colleague, he was saying about how in the first four years of the school he'd been a real rascal and he'd been excluded any number of times for misbehaviour. And then as he was talking, very seriously, he said, but of course now I'm a changed man. It's about this big, right? I'm a changed man. And my colleague Ian said to him, what do you mean, Sean? He said, well, he said, I've worked out what I want to be. I want to join the military. I've been on the website. I know what grades I want to go and I'm really working hard to get those grades. Good story, really. And then he said, the only thing is I've got a bit of a problem. And Ian said to him, what's that, Sean? And he said, well, I am changed, he said, but some of the teachers won't let me change. They carry on treating me as I used to be. And you start to think about this story. That's what I'm saying. Evidence disturbs, it interrupts, it makes you stop and think. You think about this story of this young boy on the edge of becoming an adult. He goes to school to work with people like us who are there to help him to become an adult, to take his place in society. And what happens? He feels that some of us are actually the barrier to progress. Now, there may be another story here. I'm aware of the danger of all of that in that respect. But it's evidence like this that has the power to make us stop and think and say, well, maybe there's something else we need to do here. Anyway, to finish the story, my colleague and I went to a meeting of the head teacher and the senior management team. There were about nine of them. Beforehand, we'd sent them a report, very, very positive, but with some of these little spicy stories and some of these worrying concerns that had raised. It was probably one of the lowest points of my professional career because we sat there for an hour and all we got from these teachers was we'd got it wrong, the kids had told us lies. It was not the case, none of this was true. And there may be some, may be some truth in that. But what I've learned from that, it was an extreme case, is that this use of evidence to make us think is powerful but if you don't get it right, if you don't get the timing right and the circumstances right, then people will just dismiss it. People will say, I don't want to know about it, like a denial of the situation. But I learned from all of this is the evidence and collaboration can be powerful, but it needs to be carefully managed, really. And so I draw out the sort of set of conclusions from that, the implications, really, of what we need to see going on. And I, I return to you and say, you have a contribution to make to this right from the word go as you become a member of staff in a school, really. It's about encouraging amongst all of us an inquiring stance, a questioning stance. Why are we not reaching some of our young people? What is it we're doing that means that actually they're not turned on and they don't attend? Inquiry has to become part of our professional attitude, our professional practice, collaboratively with other colleagues, but also within our own teaching, that we're constantly trying to refine our teaching. In that respect, difference becomes a resource. Too often in education, in my career, difference has been seen as a problem. If somebody's different, they're a problem, and they've got to be fixed, and if they can't be fixed, they've got to be taken out. In the kind of school I'm talking about, difference, cultural difference, linguistic difference, gender differences, differences in the way people learn, actually it becomes less of a problem and becomes more of a stimulus to make us think and experiment and try some new ways of developing our teaching. But of course, all of that will create turbulence. Just like the story of Sean makes us stop and think. And of course, when we're busy and when we're stretched, then turbulence is not what we need. We've already got enough of that. That's why creating that collaborative attitude in the school is so crucial. You're more likely to be prepared to, to tolerate turbulence if you feel you're with a group of colleagues who are, who are working together and solving problems together. That need for those working relationships is fundamental, in my view, to an effective school, but also to an, an equitable school, really. And then ultimately, this is about what we, what we might re refer to rather generally as a culture. We know that schools have cultures. Cultures are about history. History, the way we do things around here, born of experience. Now, in our most successful schools, and now you know what I mean by a successful school, not just a school that gets very good examination results, but a school that generally has ways of breaking that link between background and disadvantage and educational performance and life chances, in our most successful schools, the culture is one of including everybody, valuing difference, believing that every child matters. 
So I go back to my central message, the message that I started with, really. I believe that in our system, we have the knowledge, we have the expertise, we have the creativity to create an education system that can make sure that every child matters. The big challenge for all of us is to make sure that we have the collective will to make it happen. Thank you very much for listening to me. The thing that I would most want the students to take from this uh, lecture well, would be a commitment to do as much as possible to reach the young people that we're not reaching at the moment. And I want to, for them to understand that that's possible, but it requires a collective effort. Mm -hmm.